Okay, perfect. Um, so, hi. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm Yaksh. I'm from India. And I have my friends here, Bjana, who's from Germany, and Patricia, uh, who's from of the Philippines. Uh, and we'll be discussing one part of your presentation, which is based on the paper that we had from you, uh, which discusses the part about urban greening policies specific to the case of Ile de France. Um, so, uh, there's a part in the seminar that we just discussed, which is before the, you want me to speak up? No, it's okay. Uh, no, actually, I think ah, in the room. In the room, the okay, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, so um, let me know if this is better, but um, there's a part of the presentation earlier, which we do not cover in our discussion, but it's kind of the base for what we're discussing right now. And then there's a part after, which is about willingness to pay and willingness to travel matching, which is also outside of our paper, uh, but it's still relevant to the discussion, so keep it in mind. Um, and before I start, we also had this discussion when we were discussing the paper amongst ourselves, and it is based on a lot of the conversation that we have with our colleagues in EPOG, because most of us did not do our first year in Paris. We did it in Berlin or in Rome, which are much greener cities than Paris is. And it is a very relevant conversation that we have all had at some point um, when we moved to Paris in September last year. So before we started to discuss the paper, we just wanted to appreciate your research and the paper itself, because it's something very relevant to something that concerns all of us, because uh, most of us either have lived all our lives on in urban settings or we've moved to urban settings uh, to, to study or to work. And so we really appreciate the research <laughs> and the paper itself. But we still have some criticism <laughs> and we're gonna share that with you now. Um, so I'm gonna start with a very quick summary of the paper. The first, I mean, just three points which kind of encapsulate the whole idea. Um, so Ile de France itself is a region which is very distinct from all other regions in the world in terms of, um, how inequality functions spatially. Because if you were to look at the case of Canada or the United States or even West Africa, there is a very clear luxury effect, which means that rich people live in regions which also have better education, better healthcare, and better access to green spaces. But it's the opposite for France because the richest people also live in high density areas and also have very low access to green spaces. This is the first thing. The second thing is uh, the paper tries to study this socio-spatial inequality using an indicator. Uh, and this indicator needn't be interpreted in and of itself because it's just a decision-making uh, metric. They don't really consider the, the indicator as an outcome itself, but just as a way of deciding which kind of green investments are going to be inequality reducing. Uh, the indicator itself is built like the HDI, which most of us have come across earlier, but if not, uh, it's a geometric mean of indicators that you want to include in an overall well-being indicator. Now, the well-being indicator that they build here um, is based on uh, Bourguignon and uh, also work from Stiglitz and Sain, uh, which takes into account uh, well-being, overall well-being criteria, which includes health, education, uh, your disposable income, but also your political participation, your economic and social security. Um, and on top of that, they include two indicators of your access to environment and your disamenities from pollution and the environment. And uh, this in turn leads to uh, a weighted geometric mean, um, which is called the multi-dimensional well-being indicator and is used to measure inequality, not just on the index of income, but also on other indices. Now, my criticism here to the calculation itself of this indicator was firstly, uh, like in HDI, also in this indicator, we are agnostic to substitutability between um, what indicator we value more. So we give each indicator an equal weight. We consider education as something equally important for health, which needn't always be the case, especially when you live in a city like Paris, because pollution affects everyone differently. Everybody values education differently. Uh, people work in different regions, and so their 
made to face different conditions, which is beyond their control. And so they value different indicators differently. And so the agnosticism that this um, indicator assumes by default is something which reduces its validity to uh, a diverse space like Paris, or for that matter, any metropolitan city, also in the global south, maybe New Delhi, maybe Mexico City. Um, the second criticism is that when you look at the calculation of the environmental aspect of this um, indicator itself, it is based on some very strict standards which are set by um, international conventions. For example, you can only include access to spaces which are within 300 meters uh, of your housing or within your point of uh, accommodation and which are greater than 1.5 hectares because they say that if it's smaller than 1.5 hectares, it cannot be used for rec recreational purposes, which again is a very outdated way of looking at access to green spaces and deriving um, ecosystem services. Because even in Paris, uh, for example, I live in the 12th district and we have a sky garden there, which is very close to our uh, residence. But by this logic, it would not be considered a recreational space, which kind of uh, reduces the importance of existing green spaces in big cities, which shouldn't be the case. But then again, uh, that is only one part of the methodological criticism. Another part of it is also based on the discussion of the results, because they do a spatial analysis using three levels of simulations. The first one uh, is just based on um, using access to green spaces only as a metric of deciding where we should invest to have more green spaces. And that leads to Paris being the focus of most of the greening investment projects, which is socioeconomically not the best idea because Paris, is, Paris itself is a very, very rich part of Ile de France. And so investing more in green spaces within Paris region would further the inequalities that exist within Ile de France uh, for Paris being the richer counterpart to other suburbs which are far away from Paris. And so the second level that they add to this analysis is to have a bi-dimensional Atkinson kind of index, which is a weighted kind of an HDI of just two characteristics, um, income and access to green spaces. And this already changes the result because it takes into account both income and environmental injustice. Uh, and so there's like a 6% deviation in terms of what areas move away from the priority and what areas move into the priority. Uh, and it reduces some bidimensional inequality. But this changes completely when you look at how spatial uh, inequality is measured with the multidimensional index, because the targets completely shift outside of Paris. They go to more northern districts uh, in the suburbs where the access to green spaces is also very limited and economic inequality is also very high. Now, something that I really appreciated here when I was reading this result is based off of another paper which studies the same multidimensional inequality from the Atkinsonian perspective in Vietnam where um, they use a similar indicator to study inequality and their result is sensitive to parameters and that is also one of the things that I criticized earlier that the parameters themselves are ba are basis of biases in your study. Um, similarly um, in Vietnam the result changed when you changed the parameters. But the good thing is that when you change the parameters, which is also something that was discussed in one of the slides, uh, that the results are robust across parameters. So that is something which was really nice about this study and also consistent with how other studies uh, looked at uh, the robustness of results. Uh, but that is all for my methodological critique and I will hand over to Biana now for some extensions. Hello. Um, <clears throat> So I'm going to talk about some further considerations that could be taken into account when uh, we look at the uh, inequality measure and to determine where should we actually place new urban green spaces. And the first thing I want to highlight is show you that picture. Now that the neighborhood is nice, why do I have to move? And this uh, concerns the fact of green gentrification. Uh, this is an issue that's also partly addressed by the paper, although they kind of uh, shifted to future uh, more research uh, and don't provide a satisfactory answer to that. But just for you all to follow, um, the process of green gentrification is starting by greening initiatives, such as the ones that are uh, uh, discussed here in the paper, um, that create or restore environmental amenities. 
and then these environmental amenities draw in wealthier groups of uh, wealthier groups of residents and push out lower income residents thus creating gentrification so as you can see here if we consider these long term impacts of the urban greening projects that we may have or that the paper might suggest it could happen that instead of decreasing the inequality in uh, neighborhoods that suffer from lower income, for example, we increase in the long run the inequality by pushing exactly these people out of the neighborhoods. So my question regarding this is, um, is this just the responsibility then of uh, policymakers when they talk about uh, housing, for example, is it the responsibility of policymakers to establish rent control, to build more social housing, and this is something that the urban green spaces, urban planners don't need to think about, or is there also a place for uh, urban planners that want to establish green spaces to think about these things. For example, I stumbled upon the paper that was talking about uh, a just green enough approach. Now, this might seem a little bit uh, confusing. The basic idea is that there is going to be enough green spaces such that uh, inequality is reduced and people benefit from the benefits that come with urban green spaces, but at the same time, not too many urban green spaces, such that the neighborhoods get too um, attractive for higher income people. Um, yeah, I, I can see how this is a controversial approach, but uh, yeah, I wanted to hear your opinion on it. Um, another point is I want to discuss synergies between urban green spaces and other social infrastructure, because if we look at the paper, uh, they consider the benefits of urban green spaces in a rather um, in a rather isolated way. I think urban green spaces don't just matter about how close are they to the neighborhoods of where people live who suffer from uh, certain inequalities. Uh, for example, there can be a, a benefit in having urban green spaces maybe in richer neighborhoods if they are close to elderly care homes, for example, or similar infrastructures. To stay with the example of elderly care homes, uh, we have that people that are older are severely limited in their mobility. They will find it harder to go outside and access green spaces because, first of all, they don't have a job anymore. They don't um, go about their uh, ways every day. They uh, stay at home much rather. Um, as well as the fact that they suffer from health inequalities because obviously they are not as healthy uh, as younger individuals. And another point is that the 300 meter access for uh, older people, of course, is uh, too much of a generalization because 300 meters can look vastly different. Uh, if we look at this here, I don't know why this is, became a W instead of a V. Anyways, um, so these 300 meters obviously look different if there is a barrier free walkway that you can easily access with let's say a wheelchair or something are much easier to access than 300 meters of walkway uh, on yeah like the pebble path that you see here on the right um so going back to that i think there's much more things to consider another point i want to talk about is why do we just consider the proximity to people's homes I think what is important to think about is the places that people often frequent. For example, you will find people of lower income groups, such as students, close to universities. So it might be beneficial to have more green spaces close to universities. You will find unemployed people close to job centers. So maybe we should have green spaces close to job centers. And you'll find people who suffer from strong health impacts who work in rather industrial jobs. So should we have more green spaces close to industrial districts? I think these are all things that we could consider uh, in the paper um, to have a better understanding of where urban green spaces actually create the most benefits instead of simplifying it uh, too much in that regard. Uh, yes, going over to Tisha. Thank you. So now I wanted to discuss whether we can uh, apply this method of adding an equity criterion whenever we plan green urban spaces. So first, the question is, how can they replicate it or whether should we in the first place? So there is, uh, there is uh, evidence supporting that there are benefits if we apply it, actually. First, because there are studies that show that there's a positive relationship of urban spaces reducing segregation 
and multiplying opportunities for psychological restoration. Second, even scholars have explicitly called for adding an equity criterion when, uh, when addressing slum upgrading. And third, it's because luxury effect also in, exists in places like South Africa where green infrastructure is associated with the more abundant high income areas and those with pre previously advantaged uh, racial groups. However, there are also opposing views. Some argue that uh, the aspiration of the distributive justice in urban green spaces of the global south have not translated into policies precisely because uh, the policies itself are based on a market-based neoliberal interpretation of justice. So, for example, as stated in the paper, the existence of luxury effect in Paris is due to the uh, the trade-off between investing in new infrastructure. So because the role of the state has transformed from uh, distributing wealth to competing investments in a globalized world, uh, the main criteria by which the viability of environmental policies are based upon is, uh, for example, cost-benefit analysis. So uh, as the author mentioned earlier, when we use cost-effectiveness, we are already limited. Uh, so there is a deeper conflict of values that is not uh, reflected in this criteria, most of which are shaped by ethical, political, economic climate under which sustainability is pursued. So the question is, if that's not enough, what do we do now? So scholars like Angolovsky and colleagues invite us to take a step back first and study what created these structural inequalities in the first place. So they urge us to let go of the restributive justice principle and focus on positive rights, which entail uh, an obligation to provide services, goods, and in this case, urban green spaces to historically marginalized uh, groups or individuals. So how do we do that? So they also propose three principles towards an emancipatory uh, approach. The first principle is, uh, is called that, <laughs> emancipatory and anti-subordination, which acknowledges the imprint of settler colonialism and pri prioritizes the anti-subordination approach, which aims to dismantle asymmetrical and dynamic power structures in greening policies. So this goes uh, beyond the paper because they also call for transformations of institutions itself that reproduce the, su the subordinate social status of oppressed groups. And the second principle is called intersectional greening. So this raises questions again about those trade-offs we mentioned that must be considered to protect spaces that act as refuge for um, for minority groups. So for example, in, in TREM, in New Orleans, uh, there's a historical black community where they ascribe importance to the, to the so-called Claiborne Avenue. So because the, the marginalized people attach meanings to these places, whether the policy, uh, if the policy uh, tries to capture these meanings, uh, we go beyond the threshold set by the policy. And the last one is relational, which highlights the everyday lives of people and rehumanizing place-life relationships. So this connects the part patriarchal and racist causal factors and challenges the boundaries, typically divided by political and jurisdictional, jurisdictional factors. So again, because the paper uh, already does a good job of um, investigating the historical use of the land, I think we can expand that by uh, expanding the qualitative aspect of the study. So an example is the 11th Street Bridge Park in Washington, D.C., where there is a positive rights uh, given to the people and uh, a projection of more liberating and secure territories for African-Americans. And uh, the last thing that we wanted to highlight is that um, the institutional capacities required if we do try to replicate this in the global south. So first, what's, what is needed? It, um, according to studies, 
there must be linkages between academic and non-academic bodies and among agencies in the global south and there's also there also has to be uh a redefinition of the finance structure. So for example, Gorelick and Wounsley find that the municipal infrastructure investments through a city treasurer, when you have a local finance minister, for example, is more effective than delegating that task to the environmental agency. And the, the third one is that the leaders of these institutions should also have the environmental concerns when they uh, do their decision-making processes. And I think the last three are the, the most important. Uh, for example, there are short-term needs, of course, in Global South that uh, must be addressed first. So for example, basic infrastructure and services. And, uh, and the last two are linked, which is having the capacity to pursue the environmental agenda beyond the political career of a politician, for example. So that is one of the capacities and also linked to the last one, the legal and political sub capacities. And now these are the questions we wanted to raise. Um, so given this discussion, we wanted to have some open questions for all of us to think about and we would like your comment on them if you like to. Um, the first one is what would be potential political or institutional barriers to implementing this method? Uh, the second is should we include more specifications? Um, I'm sorry, just one sec. Uh, to account for relational justice, preferences for green spaces, uh, long-term gentrification, and reduce researcher bias in parameters. Um, and this is one of the papers that we came across, which used a completely different methodology to look at the exact same thing. And uh, they basically use a spatial econometric model instead of an index, so as to get rid of the assumptions of agnosticity within an index per se, uh, but use the distance measure of people from green blue spaces, which are measured using satellite vegetation, um, to look for um, access and inequalities to green spaces in a very green city like Oslo, which also happens to be like a left-leaning uh, municipal government. So they also have the capacity to pursue something like this. Uh, and we wanted to know what you thought about this. And Bjarne wanted to explain the last question. Uh, yeah, and uh, considering we had uh, so many contributions to how the indicator could be improved or made more specific, um, we were asking ourselves the question if uh, we should even continue uh, uh, making these indicators more and more complicated or should we rather just use the indicator as a first step and then to, to identify where we should focus on green space and then in the second step have a more qualitative and case-based approach to what actually to implement then. Uh, yeah, that would be interesting. Okay, thank you very much. Shall I, shall I answer some questions or it's with the room? <laughs> but I want to begin with a big thank of uh, for your discussion. Well, I, I was really impressed and this was really, really interesting. I noted many references, many questions in which I, I didn't think about. So a big thank <laughs> for this. Um, Maybe I, I can. I, I was. I, I noted some some things before, like for example, the the fact that uh, should should policy uh, policymaker uh, make some uh, rent control, for example, um, with uh, greening policies. Uh, and what was my point of view in that? I think uh, that uh, this would be interesting, in fact, um, because the, um, we cannot, this is the principal criticism of uh, our uh, paper is the, the potential gentrification effects. But in fact, we cannot tell and say, well, uh, we will not green the neighborhood because uh, potentially um, the, um, there will be a gentrification effect that is um, that is happening anyway in Paris. So uh, I think a real rent control um, habitat uh, housing policies will can be the solution. Um, 
so there are many questions uh and i was i, I really agreed with the uh, um 300 meters for uh, every person can be really uh, different and and according to the urban uh, morphology and everything so it was really interesting for uh, your questions in the screen right now um so uh, i already uh, talked about preferences for green spaces that could be integrated but it would uh, effectively been be an enormous study i think between a survey econometric uh, um, econometric uh, models and then integrate it in the in the indicator i think it will be a, a big war machine i don't think if it's really but it could be interesting um for the long term impact uh, i don't know uh because if we take this into account, uh, I don't know how the in really what we want to say uh, with this type of indicator. Um, but we do think uh, that uh, reducing the researcher bias was uh, um, by implying stakeholders. Um, so we implied uh, stakeholders uh, from uh, NGOs. Uh, um more related to poverty uh, at the Carmon, for example or um uh, from environmental ngos uh to discuss about these parameters and i think this was interesting and um i think uh, we can do some qualitative uh, um study to to parameterize uh, these parameters um I saw, I think, this study about Figari et al. Uh, my problem with, um, which is really interesting, my problem with most of the paper right now on uh, on spatial inequality um, on uh, urban green spaces distribution is that uh, it describes a state of the art of the distribution. Uh, so no, they do, they do not assume um, index or everything or uh, substitutability, um, substitutability or uh, inequality aversion and everything, but it just says how um, urban green spaces are distributed and assuming that uh, we have to do something after uh, with that uh, spatial planners. What I do like with our um, indicator is that uh, it simulates uh, the urban green spaces and in it it calculates what is its impact on inequality, which is very different from a state of the art of um, of uh, access, actual access or inequal distribution. I don't know if you see the difference, but I think it's really uh, this the 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 plus value of uh, this paper uh, and i think a qualitative and case-based uh, way is uh, could be really uh, interesting and uh, we thought about that but uh, years uh, passed and uh, we didn't do that uh, at all but uh, we th think about that <laughs> okay thank you lea for your answers and maybe now we can have like half an hour to open the floor for more questions from the audience. So who wants to start? Does anybody have any questions? Wait until someone asks, asks something. Okay. Uh, hello again. Um, so I was I was wondering because I was talking before about this three hundred meter access uh, thing. 
And I, I'm still not entirely convinced if this is the, the right method. I, I see how we need simplifications um, for, for this method. So that I do understand. I'm just wondering, I, I, thought, I saw in your presentation before that you were already considering some differences. So we have different, um, uh, we have different um, individuals, what are their preference, what are their abilities to pay for transport and things like that. That I, I found very interesting. Uh, what do you think are the, the limits of this? And can we, how, how much can we differ differentiate between different agents before it gets too complicated? Um, yeah, I think uh, that uh, with this kind of uh, choice experiment uh, and willingness to travel and everything, um, we can integrate uh, based on the social economic characteristic, the, um, the different preferences regarding access. And, and this is interesting. But this uh, says that uh, our um, it's better than only a 300 meter for everyone because this doesn't say anything. But this suppose that our sample is representative enough for all inhabitants uh, of uh, the Ile de France region and everything and everything. So I think it's better than uh, 300 meters, but I would be more uh, comfortable with a larger study. Uh, with a, a, a better sample and everything to to calibrate the, the this distance, because we saw that we have huge differences in willingness to travel and huge differences in urban green spaces, um, in characteristics uh, searched by uh, by inhabitants for different urban green spaces. But we are limited by the fact that, um, yeah, we we have many spatial data and we want to uh, calculate the indicator at the region, at the regional level. So uh, we have many data to collect and everything. And I was thinking about your comments uh, before on the anniversary uh, where, um, where to put green spaces, for example, uh, next to university, then jobs and everything. The problem with that is that um, we don't, we know where the universities are, but we have no social economic uh, information of uh, people in, uh, so we don't know, we know uh, where uh, people are living and what are their social economic data, but we don't know this uh, in where they are going <laughs> and their job location and everything. Um, and I just wanted to add something I was thinking about uh, before when with your 300 meters uh, that are different. I know people uh, not looking at uh, multiple dimensions, socioeconomic um, uh, dimensions and everything, but just looking at this uh, uh, access and uh, access to greenery uh, dif uh, according to different uh, paths to go to school. Uh, they do that for children uh, to go to school and to see how the inequalities between uh, of, um, um, exposure to uh, green uh, spaces or green or trees and everything in walking to school and this was nice and this was based on uh, google maps and remote sensing and many things that uh, differentiates the different pathways uh, and this was interesting uh, thank you um can we take two three questions but we want to try to prioritize agenda balance so if more Females would like to talk, please. Okay. Okay, well, um, uh, good afternoon. My name is Camila from Peru. I am from Lima, the, one of the most populated cities over uh, this earth, this specifically. Uh, so I think like for me, this case is too interesting 
I mean, like also is replicated the luxury is a uh, the luxury uh, is effect in my in my city. But I mean, like I know as far as I'm con concerned that uh, Paris was built on inequality, like the case of the Baron of Hausmann that he made some. Uh, uh, reforms in Paris. So I think that he made the poor people that underprivileged to move outside. And I don't know, but maybe nowadays I you can feel the difference inside of the in the hands uh, between Paris and between Saint Denis. But I don't know, I mean like because I only been here in Paris, my few months that I am living here and this is just only two cities, Orleans and Lille. But I don't know if uh, this case is replicated, like this luxury effect is also replicated in other French cities, given that uh, maybe Ile de France is the richest area in Paris, but I don't know if it's also replicated in other French cities. Uh, that's all. Yeah, I know very, very much Lima. Uh, so I, I know what you. Uh, I, you, I um, see we can take a wave of three questions. Ah, okay, sorry, sorry, and, sorry. Uh, so that we can optimize on time that way. Um, can you pass this to Linda and then? Hello, um, my name is Linda. I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I think it was uh, one of the first ones where you seem to do research also from a very uh, um, practical uh, perspective. So you want to to offer this knowledge to to urban planners. So I'm wondering if you could, if you would be willing to share some experience, like how do the people that actually make these decisions uh, uh, react to the to the knowledge that you provide them because I can imagine they are balancing different uh, like they're also probably dealing with this uh, gentrification question. Um, yeah, so how do you how do you relate to them as researcher? I would be interested in that. Um, hi, my name is Leonard from Germany. Thank you for the presentation. Um, my question, like I have one and a half questions, I would say. Like one question is. Um, I might might have missed it, but um, I was wondering that not only like access to some green space is important, but I feel like there are also differences in quality of the different spaces. Like, what kind of park is there? Not only that there is like some kind of green uh, lawn, but also like probably the like I don't know whether that that it impacts people the the degree of biodiversity that they're exposed to. So I was wondering whether you have some kind of qualitative difference in the kind of green space that people can access. And the other one was relating to the question that has already been raised, the, uh, the question of gentrification and um, to to what extent like there are like I just like wanted like whether you have like what kind of policies are available there up uh, like apart from like a rent um, limitation or something similar. But that's more of a half question because I know it's not like the, the core of the research question. Thank you. Okay, and now you can you, you can answer the yeah. questions if you want. Okay. To. <laughs> Sorry. Now yes. So thank you very much for your three questions. Um, yeah, I, I was saying I, I know I know well Lima too because I'm half Peruvian, so yeah, I know I know Lima too. And this, <laughs> it's um, for your question uh, how uh, this uh, study could be. Um, implemented in other cities. I think it's not applicable only on um, on cities where you have a luxury effect because uh, we have multiple dimensions of um, of uh, we have eight dimensions of well-being and uh, we have different um, different uh, rep uh, repartition of uh, this uh, scores of well-being and. Um, we have no homogeneous um, um, in all the cities of France. We have um, very different scores in uh, in many in many of uh, these uh, locations. Um, so 
I think it would give uh, interesting results uh, in the end. I think it would give interesting results in um, in cities like Montpellier, where I live, and interesting results in other cities like uh, Grenoble and big big cities like like this. So um, we, I had uh, many solicitations to apply this in. Um, in other cities, and uh, I think we will do that uh, one day, <laughs> and I will answer you uh, if it work uh, or not <laughs> one day. But uh, I think it, I won't, I, I don't see why uh, it uh, couldn't work. Um, for the decision, um, for the experience, um, it was really interesting because we had um, many, many repercussions of this project on. Uh, um, on policies, so we have um, we have impact, for example, um, on uh, different uh, associations that asked us uh, to produce information, for example, to to uh, make uh, some uh, uh, arguments for uh, trials, like for example, for the uh, pool, the Olympic pool of uh, the gardens of uh, Aubervilliers. Uh, which was um, uh, treated by uh, the ceiling. Uh, so we we produced uh, this uh, this information, saying that we are uh, with uh, this uh, treating with the ceiling. We were uh, losing, for example, many uh, many ecosystem services really important for this population, which are but of course in many uh, dimensions of well-being, like for example, uh, in health, in education, in income, in many things, and that they were losing uh, the one thing they have, uh, they had uh, before, uh, that is these gardens, which were important for uh, um, flood regulation, heat mitigation, recreation and everything. So we have this kind of experience, we have, uh, uh, experience from uh, the master plan uh, uh, where uh, they asked us to help in uh, developing this future master plan for um, for Ile de France. Um, we had experience uh, from from the Ile de France region, uh, which was not the better one, but uh, because uh, there is a I don't know how to say that. But they were they were not really interested in this uh, indicator uh, with multiple dimensions because for them they really want to to um, keep uh, this uh, this criterion on the the lowest access in urban green spaces and they don't want to hear uh, about another thing so. Yeah, this was basically the type of experience, and then and we ha we had many um, uh, solicitation to um, apply it in different uh, municipalities, which want to, uh, for example, uh, assess ecosystem services or uh, their evolution or uh, their future evolution with their future planning and everything. But um, yeah, I had to say I cannot do that in every municipality. I have to do some research. I'm sorry, <laughs> but uh, yeah. And I, uh, well, with the uh, with the report, the final report, <coughs> we give all the methodology to to do that uh, for everyone. So we hope they can do that uh, alone. Um. And uh, for uh, the UGS uh, quality, uh, yes, we have um, we have this study in uh, the willingness to travel, in which uh, we differentiate uh, with different attributes of uh, urban green spaces, and these attributes are forest cover, uh, the presence of water, the shape uh, of the urban green space, and um, the size and the way you can reach the green space. And we see many differences uh, in the preference for these attributes, but the attribute the most important for everyone is clearly uh, that uh, the green spaces has uh, tree, the trees. Um, and so um, 
yeah, uh, we can do that exactly in the inequality part, but we did that for um, for the study on the preferences dif regarding different UGS quality. And for the gentrification um, question, apart from the, poli the policy of rent uh, regulation, I don't really know because, um, yeah, it's not really my my part. I know this is not a satisfactory answer, but uh, I, I because I don't know really well uh, the subject. I I don't want to go into into this. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. Uh, do we have other questions? Does anyone have more questions? Okay. I I think we have one other question. Hello, uh, me again. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I was I was also wondering, uh, since it is not considered in the paper as well, this private green spaces, and now at least as I see it, for example, let's preface this, within Berlin, uh, there is a lot of somewhat semi-private green spaces because people like to have their little, uh, it's, it's kind of like a garden that is not part of your house, but inside of a big communities of different gardens. And although you cannot access the specific gardens, you can walk between the gardens and look into them. So it's somewhat semi-public, semi-private. Mm. Um, and another thing is a trend that we see is that uh, like architects and so on put much more focus of having strong and natural design. We're trying to plant more trees in cities and so on. Do you, how, how large do you think is the impact of these, um, yeah, of these um, green transition uh, uh, actions outside of public urban planning, uh, and and on another note, do you think it's worth considering them as well in the um, yeah in the method? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we are considering private lands, but only on the um, on the last part of the project that I presented uh, on conserving this uh, private lands, uh, uh, this private garden, because they are they are they are uh, supplying many ecosystem services that we consider also in the first part. Um, so we see that uh, like a half of uh, the quantity of ecosystem services given in the Ile-de-France region are from private lands. So they are really important to conserve. Uh, I don't have, um, I don't think that in France we have like your gardens <laughs> in Berlin, but it's really interesting. Um, so we didn't consider it in the inequality index um, because we considered that uh, it's for, for example, for mental health and uh, physical health, it's important to have access to this, uh, to this um, urban green spaces. And we saw that, for example, during the COVID-19 uh, uh, um, um, pandemics, uh, because uh, we were not uh, able to go at more than one kilometer from how Home, and uh, there are many people, for example, that didn't have access to any urban green spaces, for example, in Saint Denis or in the north of Paris. Any uh, urban green spaces, um, they're uh, at less than one kilometer. So I think private lands are really important, and um, that um, we saw that they are giving many ecosystem services. and. Uh, um, but I don't think we can integrate it in like in the inequality uh, criteria index because it would consider that people have access uh, without having access. And uh, for ar architects, uh, I, I don't think it's easy to implement it in the in this kind of uh, um, 
index inequality index but we have many other projects in where uh, they are integrated because effectively it's uh, now really interesting what uh, they are doing to integrate more nature in uh, in the in the buildings and in the um, collective um, uh, areas so yeah other project ongoing with uh, with architects which are doing great thing right now thank you thank you do we have someone else no well with that i will hand over back to our academic representative here <laughs> so thank you very much lea merci beaucoup Thank you very much uh, to you. Merci beaucoup d'avoir d'être venu en époque participer. Et puis uh, puis à bientôt, j'espère. Oui, à très bientôt et merci uh, à la promo qui uh, made des très very interesting questions. So, thank you very much. Goodbye.